busting legal myths about how long agreements need to be. My word, some legal agreements that my clients send me to review are just pages and pages and pages of what I saw was like 300 pages long. So the myth we are busting today is that if you have an agreement in your business, you do, it does not have to be long and complicated. Let's simplify our lives. In fact, the longer it is and the more complicated it is, the more likely that something's gonna go wrong because who can understand that stuff? It gives me a headache. So when you have a business arrangement with someone, it's very sensible to get it in writing, whatever the business arrangement is. Whether you're collaborating with somebody, whether it's your customers you're selling to, uh, if you're a coach and you're providing services, it's always sensible to have a, an agreement. But please, don't have one that's gonna give your client a headache. The point of the agreement is just to make sure that you're safe and they're safe. Put it in normal English language, make sure if you're going, going to a lawyer, make sure your lawyer writes it in such a way that you understand it. If you don't understand what is in your own agreement, how are you going to expect your clients to? There was an old fashioned technique decades ago of creating legal agreements in legal mumbo jumbo so that only the lawyers could understand them. And that was kind of a way of locking people out of uh, being able to do their own agreements. Those days are long gone. Any good lawyer should be providing you with an agreement that you can easily understand. And if there's anything in there that you don't understand, please ask them and ask them to rewrite it so that it's easier to understand. If you need a translator, then it's probably not quite right yet. The other point with agreements is they need to cover off basic things like money, who's going to pay, when, what, uh, what happens if your relationship breaks down, especially with a collaboration, who's going to own the intellectual property. And you need to check up on your lawyer because being an IP specialist, I have a particular interest in intellectual property, but I'm amazed at how many agreements I see, uh, partnerships, collaboration, that kind of thing, that don't deal with what happens to intellectual property in the event that the relationship breaks down. So deal with intellectual property. And if you're, if you're providing a service or, or selling goods, what happens if your client or your customer is not satisfied? Now, most good coaches uh, or other kind of service providers, if the client is not satisfied, they will simply provide a refund because it's not worth the, the aggravation um, or the reputational damage, for, for example, of arguing about it. If that client is not satisfied with what you've provided, I'm not saying you have to, but most good coaches will do this, they will just provide a no questions asked uh, refund because they're so confident in their ability that they know they're gonna get a better client who gels with them. And that if you get a complaint, that's often a good opportunity to review your terms and your, your discovery process for bringing people into your, into your fold. So, if people are not satisfied with what you're providing, that's a hotbed for dispute. My recommendation is select your clients more carefully. But what about if you provide goods, particularly if, you know, mail order goods? People can buy them and you post them out. You need to cover things like who carries the risk. Usually I say just get your own insurance and, and you carry the risk so that your clients are comfortable. But can you use your in agreements to build relationships and you certainly can for example one of my clients is uh, she makes dog food actually I've got several clients who make dog food <laughs> but the one I'm thinking of uh, I asked her about her, her returns policy because my dog is the fussiest dog on the universe Einstein loves people but he doesn't care about food so I said to her what happens if I order food from you for Einstein and he's not so keen on the food and then like I wasted my 20 bucks on this bag of food. And she said, well, I'm happy to offer a refund. And I said to her, well, your terms actually don't say that. 
and of course the thought comes to your mind well what happens if people just order so that they can get something free from you and to be honest most people aren't like that but i said to her why don't we make it a term of your conditions that if they're not satisfied that they agree that they will drop that food off at their local rspca because now this is telling your clients something about you that you really are concerned about animals and ask them if it would be nice if they would send you a photo so that you could see uh, the, the RSPCA people being happy with your food. Don't make it that a condition though. Uh, and we would love to see the photo of you dropping it off, something like that. Since she created that, she hasn't had anybody complain or ask for a refund because it's about them thinking about her mindset. And there might have been a couple of people whose dogs are fussy and didn't like the food. They've probably just gone and dropped it off at the RSPCA and not even bothered about a refund. So the myth that we busted today is that your terms and conditions do not need to be complicated. They do not need to be long. And in fact, they should be easy for you and your clients to understand. If you need a, an interpreter to interpret them, then you've probably gone wrong somewhere along the way. It has been awesome fun busting legal myths with you to protect your business so that you can live the lifestyle that you deserve. My name is Catherine Warburton. I am the Legal Lioness.